Welcome to the Investing Podcast presented by Tusk Media. This is Outsider Trading, an audio and video deep dive into the people, places, and things that we find most interesting in the market. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Investing Podcast. Tuesday, October 11th, 2016. I'm Andrew Hall. Joining me, Ben Nye. How's it going? Doing well, doing well. Very good. Pardon my unprofessionalism. Worked out this morning, no big deal. No big deal. Woo! Barely had time. Ran up a mountain, right? Barely had time to run up a mountain and back down after lifting weights. And definitely didn't have time to grab a shower. So, I mean, it's it's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's a lifestyle. But we're here nonetheless, ready to talk about the markets. Uh, run through the futures real quick for you. Dow futures down 0.09%. S&P futures down 0.17%. NASDAQ futures basically flat, but still down one basis point. A little bit of a red gasm going. Gold down about a quarter of a percent. Oil down about 1%. And I think that's kind of where we're going to start off talking. Oil trading $50.83 a barrel over that $50 mark. Uh, where are we going from here? Because we kind of have this Russian roulette, this stare down with OPEC, right. with Russia. Lots going on here. Yeah, well, I mean, oil has just rallied so strongly, and we had we had a pretty nice day yesterday. A lot of assets yeah. were up. Um, bonds obviously closed for Columbus Day, um, but as far as oil goes, oil has really rallied pretty strongly on the back of this OPEC news that OPEC is going to cut production uh, at their meeting next month, uh, at end of November. Uh, the idea is that they're going to cut from a little bit over 33 million barrels a day to 32, between 32 and a half million to 33 million barrels a day. So a very modest cut. Mm -hmm. uh, but That's what, like one and a half percent, something like that? Yeah, yeah. something like that. But the <laughs> idea that um, OPEC is actually saying that, you know, we're actually going to try to exert some control over the market, which hasn't happened for a number of years yeah. now, um, is... Is, is new, and I think the markets responded to that. question is, does it have any teeth? Right. Because that's that, and the, the follow-up would almost be, why now? Right. You know, we've seen so much volatility with the pricing of oil, uh, especially if you look over the last two, two and a half years. It's kind of crazy to think that at this point, OPEC is actually going to step in and inter intervene, show some control, and that they're actually going to intervene and show some control in a way that would strengthen the price of right. oil. Uh, while reducing output just seems totally counter to what we've seen from them for the last, really forever, right. it seems like. And it, it, I mean, is Saudi Arabia going to do it? I mean, and it seems like Saudi Arabia is not going to do it alone, mm -hmm. but who's going to go with them? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you have, so Putin comes out yesterday, and the reason that oil rallied yesterday was because he was saying, you know, we could get on board with some sort of cut, maybe. Um, we'll see what kind of happens in well, November, see, so they say. It seems like the ultimate <laughs> yeah. bluff. The yeah, ultimate exactly. bluff coming from Putin. Uh, like, I, I would not want to do a deal. I, I would not do a deal with Putin because I, 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 I'm sure that, you know, you'd have ways that Putin could get around the deal. And, you know, he, he might talk his cheap. Mm -hmm. Talk his cheap. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see if they can actually come through with actions. My personal opinion is that they won't. And uh, right now, it has historically been a little bit of a difficult time to own oil, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just in general. Yeah, and it, it seems like you mentioned not wanting to do a deal with Putin. I won't tell Trump you said that. Um, but OPEC and Putin, like two pretty low characters in terms of, I'm going to believe the, right, <laughs> these exactly. entities as they speak and make promises. So, yeah, kind of this, this stare down. All the while, the market reacting like both of these things are a reality, which is a little bit odd to me, just yeah. how sharply oil has risen, really, over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure if there's a big short position ahead of time, mm -hmm. and people are just trying to get it, get ahead of it now. Uh, I would expect, also, when you see prices rise like this, a lot of distressed companies, especially in North America, want to hedge oil. So when, when you hedge oil, you go out in the future and you sell futures contracts, mm -hmm. Um, basically saying, I'm going to deliver oil at $50 or $55 net in six months' time, and I'm just going to lock that price in now. The thing is, when you're selling those future contracts, it brings down the whole curve, and it puts a bit of a ceiling on the oil price, which may prevent some further upward mobility in the mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. So definitely something to keep an eye on there with oil and really just who follows through with what they're promising or threatening to do whatever however you view that I guess right. uh, let's talk about China a little bit interesting 
concept coming out, it almost sounds like a bankruptcy coming yeah. out, but we're calling it officially a Chinese fire drill. Yeah. So, so the big article in Wall Street Journal yesterday morning, um, the idea is that uh, distressed corporate entities in China will be able to convert their debt into equity um, for, the, uh, for the debt holders. The question is, you know, well, isn't this what happens to distressed companies in the United States right. and Europe? And this is called bankruptcy. Uh, but, but the thing is, in China, when a bank lends money to a corporate entity, they just mark that on their books. They don't necessarily take a write down. They don't need a capital, additional capital reserve. When they're on equity, they need additional capital reserves. So the thinking is, although the debt conversion to equity might help some of these troubled corporate entities in China, it might hurt the banks, the banks because they have to build up their reserves. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that washes out. I don't believe that anything is finalized yet, um, but there's always just so much confusion on it, all news coming out of China. Um, you have so much government intervention, and when you see something like this, like a huge, almost a transfer of the risk, you know, right. moving it off the corporate balance sheet to the bank in the United States, you would process that very differently. Yeah. Because even over there, you're saying, well, what's what's really truly independent corporations, independent banks? Right, like and that. you actually have audits and actual right. accounting books that are legitimate. We've got rules. Right, <laughs> so so when, when you do have a reasonable expectation of a loss on a bond, then you then you write it down, and then so when you do convert to equity, the, the hit isn't as big, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully you're diversified, right. which I'm not sure a lot of these Chinese companies right. are. Right. So let's transition from that. Those are a couple market stories to uh, some individual stocks, a couple names, uh, starting off with Mylan. Talk to us about what's going on there. Obviously, they've been in the headlines for not necessarily the right reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so Friday Friday <coughs> afternoon, so Mylan, obviously, the company that produces the EpiPen, um, they, uh, they, they purchased it in 2007. Um, Mylan issued a press release Friday afternoon. So when you see Friday afternoon press usually releases, not good news. it's usually not good news. In this case, it was a bit surprising because the press release said, you know, we have a settlement with the, uh, with the authorities and it's going to be $465 million pre-tax charge one time and then we're going to move on. Mm -hmm. They took down guidance a little bit, um, but then in 2018 they said, you know, we still expect uh, $6 a share in earnings. So that was actually good news. You look at the SEC filing, so when you issue a press release, you also need an SEC filing. They added an F regulation FD disclosure that says, well, the SEC has actually come to us now and they're requesting documents too. Um, so there are a, a few not so good things mm -hmm. uh, dispersed within that Mylan uh, statement that suggests that there could be more problems to come. Furthermore, um, the actual underlying issue for CMS, uh, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, um, was that they were paying uh, a different rebate. So when, uh, when they have these negotiations with Mylan or any drug company, there's a negotiation based on you have to pay a rebate, the drug company has to pay a rebate based on the type of drug it is. Mm -hmm. So for EpiPen, it was classed as a non-innovator drug, which sounds, oh, well, they're, maybe they're being conservative. Like, we're not, we're not <laughs> innovating, you know, it's, it's going to be cheaper. But they actually only have a 13% rebate on that. Wow. The innovator drug has a 23% rebate. So they're now charging, they're gonna, Mylan's going to be on the hook for a 23% rebate instead of a 13% re rebate. And that starts April 2017. So something so, to look forward to. So, yeah, so something to look forward to. Analysts have to adjust their models, so it'll be interesting to see how the earnings expectations uh, change uh, on those analyst forecasts. There we go. Speaking of earnings expectations and changes that are kind of in the pipeline, uh, Yum Brands. So Yum, and also kind of dovetailing on our conversation on China earlier, Yum is spinning off Chinese stores. This isn't news. This was announced, I think, last October, I believe, but it becomes official uh, the last day of this month. So they'll spin that out. You know, Yum operates KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, some of the finer establishments in the world. Um, so they have spun that off, gearing towards, and this is not necessarily a new thing either, but the formal announcement is more clear, but they've been gearing more and more towards a franchise-only model. So now they've released some plans on that. 
uh, and they made some announcements yesterday. By 2019, they're going to transition to being 98% franchise operated. The whole goal here to basically be, let's increase same store sales, let's decrease things like CapEx. CapEx for 2015 was almost $500 million. By 2019, that's going to go down to $100 million. And they're going to try to get some more money back to shareholders, so about $13.5 billion between now and 2019, both in share buybacks and dividends. So Young doing some things that a lot of people like in stocks up about 1.5% pre-market. But unlike a lot of stocks, we've talked about kind of in the restaurant industry, and obviously it maybe isn't necessarily a direct comp to Darden and some of those right. groups. Uh, but the stock's up about 20% year to date. So it's been a solid performer. Yeah, it's it's done well. And a lot, I think a lot of that's due to a little bit more confidence in China. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a question for you. So if they're going towards this franchise model, if you had to own a franchise mm -hmm. of Yum, what franchise would it be? Pizza Hut, no doubt. Pizza Hut. Um, Is that I, just because of free pizza then, like all, all day long? Or? I'm a big fan of Pizza Hut's innovation in terms of wings. Mm. Giant cookies, um, all kinds of great stuff. I like Taco Bell a lot, but I would eat Taco Bell more than I would eat Pizza Hut. And there's no way uh, my GI tract would survive that. There's just no way you survive owning a Taco Bell, I don't think. No, I think that's fair. The life expectancy for franchisees of Taco Bell cannot be. <laughs> uh, that, that's not a guarantee. But that, that's a hot take. Yeah, right? yeah. What, what, what about you? KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell? I think what else they got in there? Um, I think I'd be a pizza hut guy too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of a pizza guy. I think KFC is kind of a, there's so many better chicken places I feel, and and same with honestly with Taco Bell mm -hmm. too. I mean, there's I think they're far better kind of boutique like burrito places. Yeah, KFC is interesting. You know, they I'm not talking through, about Chipotle. Not Chipotle. <laughs> uh, they went through KFC I think in April and they started just kind of modernizing KFC, which is just such a funny concept. But um, in college, I had a friend that had been over to China and eaten at a KFC, and he's like, no, they're like gourmet. Like, it's like the place to eat. Like, KFC is the best. So, so kind of interesting perspective there, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and he's like, the food was exactly the same, but he's like, but it's a nice, like, sit-down restaurant. Um, interesting. So there you go with KFC. Last stock we're going to hit on, at least in this segment, Twitter, we talked on it last week at length. Go back, check out our YouTube ar archive. If you go to YouTube, search for Tusk Media. Mm -hmm. All our stuff shows up. It's also on Seeking Alpha. I think it was up on Thursday. It's Thursday's video of last week. But Twitter, just all over the place, continued speculation about the buyouts. At the end of the day, you know, I think we got out of the stock at around 20 bucks. Uh, took a huge loss on it, full disclosure, for most of our clients. Um, but we got out just because the story was becoming so dominated by these buyout rumors, this buyout speculation. It just continued to seem less and yeah. less founded, and it was harder and harder to justify. And to be honest, I, I'm a big fan of Twitter, the platform. I think the business could use some improvement. I think we graphed this out. It's like you got the platform way up here, you got the business down here, not awful, and then you got management that's really poor. Um, I still feel like with the right management, this platform could really take off and expand more, and the business side could be, grow more efficient. But all of that's been just washed out by these buyouts you know, and all this rumor. So the stock basically went from like 15 bucks to the mid to high 20s, purely on the speculation on all these big players. When we talked about it last Thursday, there was one player still in Salesforce. That was the only one. Stock was down 12% yesterday now on rumors that Salesforce is out. A lot of analysts are now saying stock would have to get back down to like 14 or 15 bucks for anybody to be able to make a deal that would actually be attractive enough to get signed off by the board and all that good stuff. So it's a company that's in a bad spot. You combine that with continued pressure, not just from Facebook, I think like Snap Inc. Yep. Announcing their IPO is going to put more pressure on them, at least from a perception, you know, and maybe a retail eye, you know, comparing the two things. They're in a bad spot, man. And yeah. they're trading under 18 bucks right now, and it just seems like, seems like they're going down. Right, and, and you see so many people, especially in our industry, who are talking about, you know, it just has such great usefulness mm -hmm. in terms of a tremendous way to read news in a timely manner and, and, and read it when it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and there's appears to be just this immense frustration on the, and the, on the part of users mm -hmm. and investors alike that they just have not added value. There's an interesting blog up today by a hedge fund manager by the name of John Hempton. Uh, his website is Bronte Capital. 
he got he kind of goes through it. You know, there's no strategic buyer. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent there there will be a buyer, it will be a financial buyer, and he just makes the point. Expenses have increased 1.5 billion in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and he's like, "What have they actually done right. to improve the product?" And from a user perspective, you know, it, it, that's very simple terms, but right. um, sometimes just distilling it to that is incredibly. This makes a lot of sense. And 1.5 billion. And the greatest innovation I think they've had over the last two to three years has been Periscope, which they acquired. Which they acquired. And exactly. they acquired for a fraction of that. I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was not a $1.5 billion right. dollar, <laughs> you know, acquisition or anything like that. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting to, to watch that. Um, you know, obviously, I guess from a PM perspective, you know, we could have written it out, gotten out at a much higher price. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I guess in some ways, kind of our theory that, hey, this is all basically being propped up and pushed up by speculation that's relatively right. unfounded. Uh, at least that's what we're continuing to see right now. Who knows, somebody may come in. Uh, but for now, definitely a stock to kind of keep an eye on and maybe maybe be hesitant to jump back in. I, I do think there's still a potential buyout, and I, I kind of agree that $14 range is where maybe you nibble a little bit and hope yeah. you get taken out. It's an option at 14 I think. Right. Uh, but but even here where it is at 17 80 or something like that, still not that attractive. This is the Market Overview. Andrew Hall, Ben Nye. Uh, hit subscribe if you're on YouTube. Like us on iTunes. You can just search Tusk Media. We show up. Twitter at Tusk Media LLC. And, and, and send us your tickers if you want us to hit on the stock too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's we can, it. We can yeah. include it right here. Yeah, so if you got anything you want to hear about, let us know. And I know Ben will be back talking about some stocks here in just a few yeah. minutes. Hey, everybody, welcome to Earnings 101, uh, the quarterly segment in which we explain what earnings are. Andrew Hall, <laughs> Matt Krebsoff, what's up? Not much. How's it going? Doing good, doing good. So, well, can, before we get into that, I don't. Wow. I, I can't. I can't believe you said Pizza Hut though. Like I'm. I'm pretty poor, and he chose Pizza Hut. What would you choose, Taco Bell? Well, one, I would choose Domino's or Pizza Hut all day. But that's not a young brand. I, I know, but I'm just saying. Okay. I'd I'd choose KFC. Really? KFC is delicious, man. That's because you're from the north. Probably. It's not even like good fried chicken. I mean, it's fine. It's passable. <laughs> that's but, absurd. But if you're from Wisconsin. It's probably the best thing you've ever had. So I'll, 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 I'll give you points is, for that. It's pretty good. I'll give you points for that. Uh, <laughs> so if you missed our first segment, <laughs> we picked franchises of Yum. So you would have gone KFC. Yeah. I chose Pizza Hut. Uh, no takers on Taco Bell, which is interesting. I do like Taco Bell, but I, I like them all. You made a good argument with Taco Bell. Yeah, I would. I would struggle real, <laughs> real hard there. Yeah. Um, so earnings 101. Yeah. What we do is we explain earnings. We're at the beginning of earnings season, which means a lot of our market overview, a lot of our stock talk is really going to focus on this thing called earnings. So Krebsbach, uh, Earnings 101, what is earnings? What are earnings? Well, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. It's pretty self-explanatory. Every, I, I guess for the most part, every quarter, so like, let's say fi a fiscal quarter, so mm -hmm. let's say m ending September 30th now, like a month, about a month after that, or, you know, a couple weeks after that, companies release their earnings and their financial statements company back. Yeah, so they come out and they said, hey, last quarter, here's what mm -hmm. happened from a financial perspective. You get a lot of data, so sometimes you'll get stuff, so if we yeah. want to use the example of Yum Brands, you'll get stuff like, hey, here's what same store locations did, mm -hmm. here's how well they did, here's what their sales numbers were, here's what their expenses kind of lumped together, you get some line items so in pretty there. Pretty much everything that drives their stock price, you get to see. You get to see it, numbers and, and they have to report this, this is a requirement, <laughs> and they have to be accurate. Sometimes you'll see adjusted earnings numbers, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, the earnings number is really simple. It simply means how much money did this company make? And then you typically see it, a lot of times reported as earnings per share, which is really a simple equation. You see how much money they got, how many shares are out in the marketplace. Do a little math and find out, hey, how much did each share take home? And within, quote unquote, within a day after the release, though, is usually, yeah, that's usually, yeah. Um, the management team has a conference call. Mm -hmm. And those are times where management has like their structured, statements then a lot of analysts chime in and they ask questions and they answer them they're usually they can be really informed yeah. so, sometimes they're kind of boilerplate yeah you don't get that much but other times they're really informative so the big things that we would say about earnings is earnings really is as cliche as it sounds it's just a number because in mm -hmm. some ways what drives earnings even more than just that number is what the expectations are. right right so talk to the people out there about how expectations play into earnings and what could be good what could be bad well you can see like huge run-ups going into earnings. I, I think you saw it with Micron, just like mm -hmm. as an example, you saw a huge run up and then 
the earnings numbers were pretty good if I remember. I didn't look too deep into Micron since I don't, none of my accounts hold Micron. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> Rest in peace. Um, so like you had, you had like you had like a, a strong run up. The earnings were pretty good, and then the stock was kind of. I think it traded down right after, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. then it kind of rebounded to, to flat on that good earnings report because there's positive expectations right. going into it. Right. So a, a a great example is you know let's say that people say hey. The Tusk, Tusk Media, they're right in this one little niche. Here's what people expect. We think they're going to make $4 per share. It doesn't really matter what we made last quarter or a year ago. What starts to really matter is that people start to say they're going to make 4 bucks a share. Now, even if last year we only made one, if we report $3.85 a share, we're probably going to get beat up for it yeah, because pretty people hard. wanted 4 uh, If last year we made 10 bucks, but people expect 4 now and we make 4.01. We might actually see a little bit of a rally because people see that. And then often you'll see management teams uh, alter their guidance, which is kind of their expectation, what they expect to see, uh, either for the quarters ahead or the full fiscal year, things like that. So you'll also get some reaction to that. So I guess in summary, when you're looking at earnings, kind of keep some context. It's really easy to find what expectations are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go to Market Watch. You can go to like a slew of different resources if, if you're at home. And you can even search in, just search a ticker. You could say, you know, Twitter, the company we just mentioned. Type in the ticker, TWTR, earnings, expectations, mm-hmm. and you can find 100 resources that will show you what the analyst community expects and just understand that really that's going to be what drives it. I think earnings are specifically a great time where if you have a stock that you're, like, looking to add to, mm-hmm. like it's a great time to just wait. Hopefully they miss by, like, 10%, just per, 10% of the earnings, yeah. which long-term, that really means nothing. Right. But the stock will trade off 10%, mm-hmm. and you can add at a, at a steep discount. And you'll see, justified. you'll see a lot of overreaction mm-hmm. to that movement, that spread between you know the expectation and the actual earnings. And then a lot of times people, frankly, won't do the dirty work to actually read mm-hmm. it. And a lot of times there's really legitimate reasons for it. Sometimes yeah. Yeah. You know, it could be something like seasonality, it could be weather, it could mm-hmm. be whatever it may be. You can find all kinds of factors that really defend that gap in earnings, mm-hmm. it could just be expectations were too high. We're really pleased with how we did this quarter, despite the analyst community ex- mm-hmm. expecting this. But the reality is it's going to take longer for this company to turn around or whatever it may be. So, yeah, it's a great time to find some bargains. Also, if you have a stock that you know you feel like really has had a run up, sometimes if they actually hit that earnings number and they beat it, that's a good time to look at maybe drumming a position, mm-hmm. things like that. So that's kind of the overview on earnings. Uh, I know we're going to be talking about earnings for a lot of companies over the next couple of weeks, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Hi everybody, um, Ben and I back to talk to you a little bit about Alcoa. Alcoa issued its earnings uh, this morning. They are usually one of the first people to report every quarter, and they're important to watch because they provide a lot of the, not so much what Alcoa themselves actually does, but what they are talking about for their customers. Because they sell aluminum, Alcoa sells aluminum to many different applications and many different industries across many different geographies. So they break that out and they tell you exactly what they expect they're going to do for the full year in each one of those regions. And they update this every quarter so you can kind of see how that changes over time. A um, couple idiosyncratic things with Alcoa first before I hit that is that they actually missed earnings expectations. They had 32 cents a share versus expectations of 34 cents. They also missed on revenue and they also missed on EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, of taxes, depreciation, amortization. Um, there's been a lot of stuff going on at corporate for Alcoa. They are going to be doing a spin off of their value added segment, which they're going to call Arconic. The current CEO is moving to Arconic, and Alcoa will be left as simply the uh, commodity company and not the value-added segment. They also did a one-for-three reverse stock split uh, last week, and so now when you look at Alcoa, you're saying, well, they're trading at over $30 a share, but this was a $10 stock. This is effectively a $10 stock because they did that one-for-three split. Um, So let's go and hit on what Alcoa is saying about the end market. So a lot of the guidance was reiterated, including the aerospace guidance. That was reiterated at no growth for the full year. Um, Auto guidance was actually taken down in North America, brought up in China. So if you're a company that sells more to China than North America, then you're looking pretty good. If it's the reverse, then it's it's not so good. 
Um, companies with high degree of exposure to China include uh, companies like GM. Ford has less exposure than GM to China, which may explain some of the discrepancy in the stock price performance year to date. Um, heavy duty truck has just been a gong show in North America. It's expected to be down 30 to 28 percent, 28 to 30 percent down in North America. But in China, it was revised up. Before, Alcoa was expecting up 2 to 4 percent. Now they're expecting up 13 to 15 percent. This means that China is buying a lot of these big, those big 18 wheelers that you see. A lot more is going to be transported on these big semi trucks. So if you're a big truck company that sells into China, think maybe uh, a Volvo, for instance, um, you may be in a little bit of better uh, situation than, say, a Packard. Um, packaging uh, is, an, is an important business for them. No real changes there. Some modest, modest adjustments around the edges. Uh, building construction. Um, no real change in North America. In Europe, it was actually brought up slightly uh, to up 0 to 1% from essentially flat. So now seeing a little bit more modest growth in Europe. So that's good signs. On that, we're seeing a little bit of an upgrade to Europe, a little bit of an upgrade to China, a little bit of a downgrade in North America. So that's what Alcoa is seeing in the market. Um, interesting because everyone's been kind of been talking about North American leading the way in terms of growth. Alcoa sees it differently. So when you're making your investment decisions, consider the implications of what Alcoa is saying. And that might help to inform you and give you a little bit of a variant view going forward. So that's been Alcoa. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, tweet at us at Tusk Media LLC. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, everybody, now it's time for your favorite part of the show, the quote of the day. Um, you'll have to excuse me for not being all dressed up. I uh, worked out pretty hard this morning with Andrew. <laughs> not a big deal. I mean, uh, I don't even know why I mentioned it. We do it all the time. But uh, that's why I just didn't have time to shower. You know, I had to be here for you guys instead. Um, so the quote of the day today has to do with franchising, which we've talked about. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory from a pretty popular song that I think most of you probably know already. Um, it's from a, a little, little guy named John Cena. Here's how it goes. Your time is up. My time is now. You can't see me. My time is now. It's the franchise. Boy, I'm shining now. You can't see me. My time is now. Y'all enjoy your day. Tusk Media is a subsidiary of Narwhal Capital Management. Ratings and reviews of Tusk Media content are not to be construed as endorsements of opinions, analysis, or services offered by Tusk or its parent company. The opinions and predictions shared here are our professional beliefs at the time of publication. We are not under duress from any of the corporate entities mentioned. This is not a solicitation to take any particular action. Although we are investment advisors, this information should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. We strive to be as impartial, insightful, and accurate as possible. We base our opinions, analysis, and calculations on information we believe to be reliable, but we cannot guarantee its accuracy. We can, however, guarantee that our opinions will sometimes be flat out wrong due to a variety of factors. Employees and clients of Narwhal Capital Management may or may not hold positions in the securities detailed and may or may not hold these positions in the future. A full list of all securities purchased, sold, or held during the 12 months preceding the date of this publication can be provided upon request. Unless otherwise noted, all data accessed via MarketWatch or the Bloomberg Terminal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. A copy of Narwhal's form ADV is available at the SEC's website, www.advisorinfo.sec.gov, or from Narwhal upon written request.